Hello, this is Graham Phillips here in Russia. And what to say, welcome to Moscow. Where I'm just now is simply one of the most iconic places in the world, Red Square. But how much do you know about Red Square, apart from it being a big square? Well, for starters, it's not even one of the biggest squares in Russia. So it's not even the biggest square in Moscow, however, it's perhaps the most famous, iconic square in the whole world. However, it wasn't always like that. In the early days, Red Square was something like a slum, a shanty town, comprising of degenerates and ne'er-do-wells, criminals, as you will, cast out from out with the medieval city walls due to their lowly status. It was cleared by Ivan III in the 1400s and over the centuries has evolved to become what we see around me today, quite magnificent and almost certainly the first place that any tourist coming to Moscow will come to check out. So what is Red Square today? Well, it's a place that you can come any day, any time, any time of year and find people here from all over the world. I was here in February and this is what it was like. As you're saying, cheese! cheese. So how do you like uh, Moscow? What are your impressions? Oh, oh we love Moscow. Amazing, yeah. We love Moscow. No. <laughs> <laughs> you look fantastic, I would say. Thank you, Thank you so much. And what's, uh, what's it like here? What are the people like? And what's oh, they are the... very kind, really. Here in Moscow, people are very kind, yes. So you're on holiday? Yes. Have a great time in Moscow, ladies. Dobry Prajalit. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye for now. So we're back, it's mid-April, let's have a look and see who's in Red Square today. Can you uh, say a couple of words about Red Square for people around the world? What place is uh, Red Square? The Red Place is the centre of the country, I think so. <laughs> yes, and uh, we always see it uh, on the New, New Year parties and uh, the Victory Day on 9th of May, yes. And uh, this is a very beautiful place. And what's it like to be here? What's the atmosphere? The atmosphere? Mm, the touristic place and uh, maybe the country's atmosphere. I, when I'm here, I feel that I'm a Russian person. And where are you from? Uh, we are from Irkutsk. Irkutsk? Yes. Very pleased the, to meet you. Nice to meet you what's too. What's your name? My name is Alice. Very pleased to meet you, Alice. Thank you for Thank that. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.
And where are you from? France. France. Ah, you're from France? Yes. And the football is for? Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's for uh, our uh, trip for oh. French people who will come in Moscow. For the World Cup? Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. Can you say a couple of words about Red Square for the international, all over the world people are going to come. What's it like here on Red Square? What's the atmosphere? History first, I think, and then second, uh, the Russian, the culture and uh, the people too. And it's a big event in the world for the competitions of the football. And uh, France, fun. Denmark, to the 6th of June, it's a big match for France. So you're looking forward to that and there's going to be lots yes. of French fans. And what should they expect? How to describe here? We're in Moscow at the moment. What's it like? I, I, I live in Moscow uh, uh, since two days. Two days. I don't know everything. I don't know. I know very well Miss Maria, Maria Romanova. <laughs> and do you like it here? Are people uh, friendly? How? Uh... Yes. Yes. Restaurant people. Uh, every place of of Moscow. And uh, I, uh, which is uh, the match? France has marked the best. Will be the best. Enchanté, merci beaucoup. You're welcome. And what's your name? Jean Francois. Jean Francois, very pleased to meet you, Jean Francois. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you very merci much. <laughs>
So victory day in Red Square. Red Square, Krasnaya Ploshed in Russian. An interesting fact, Krasnaya originally meant beautiful in Russian and only evolved in recent times to come to mean red and with that red square which is the symbol it represents Russia. When you think of Russia this is perhaps your first association, St Basil's Cathedral, constructed under the oars of the man we know as Ivan the Terrible between 1555 and 1561, and in fact the tallest building in Russia until around 1600. Now like the Kremlin to my left, which we'll come to later, St Basil's Cathedral is open to the public. You can go inside and check it out which is what I'm going to do just now. <laughs> 500 rubles, about six pounds in the current exchange rate. The design, absolutely breathtaking. Ten of these signature onion domes rising into the sky like a bonfire. Even when it built today, it would be an outstanding achievement in architecture. Each of them incredibly intricate, complex, just astounding. Now legend has it that when St Basil's Cathedral was completed, Ivan the Terrible was so intent that the beauty would never be duplicated or replicated that he had the architect Ivan Yakovlev blinded. But that would seem to be an urban myth because there's record of Ivan Yakovlev working in several other significant projects. So the large red building behind me, the History Museum of Russia. But unfortunately there's no time to do everything or even a fracture. There's just so much to do in Moscow. We would be here until the end of time. But what we are going to do is check out this impressive, imposing structure to my left, the shopping arcade Gum, the first shopping arcade in Russia 125 years ago. And to this day, the most famous, iconic, let's go and have a look at Gum. <laughs> This is cool, an exhibition of Land Rovers here in Guma. I love Land Rovers. In fact, not only, look what we got. Daniel Craig, uh, James Bond, Bear Grylls, Land Rover Bar, Paul Smith. Uh, so you get the idea, British icons here. Uh, Jamie Oliver is obviously a bit of a tool, but in any case, the principle is it's the kind of best of Britain here being represented. Uh, Land Rover is obviously a symbol of the UK and in fact ahead of me we've got this quite stunning Land Rover Discovery decked out in full-on touring kit, all the apparel including camel trophies we see, a Russian flag on the bonnet, there we go camel trophy, look at this complete with a canoe, a kayak in the roof, whichever it is.
and the roof is the genius of engineer Vladimir Shekulov and it remains to this day a masterpiece of engineering. Have a look at it. Now the original name of Gum translates something like Upper Trading Rose and Gum to this day is a place for the well heeled of Moscow to come and partake of the exclusive elite's boutiques and also a place for tourists to come and walk around and just marvel in the wonder of it all. You've never seen a shopping centre like it in your life. People love the ice creams of Gum, by the way. It's a real thing to do, a real Moscow thing to do, to come to Gum and have an ice cream. So as you can see, over here we've got some basils, the Kremlin Red Square, just a couple hundred metres away. We've come up to this mound, all landscaped, really uh, cool. And uh, if we look over there, we've got Pariashi Bridge. It's actually not quite a bridge. It's, well, let's have a look and see what it is. So as we can see, giving just incredible views up and down the Moskva, all the landmarks near and far and up from it, this new amphitheatre, this open air theatre behind me. As we see nothing in play at the moment, but still people sitting out enjoying the sun this spring day. A bit breezy as it is, but still uh, incredibly beautiful here in Moscow. In fact, just behind that white building, Dom Nakatelnitskoy, uh, one of the most elite apartment buildings of the Soviet Union and to this day remaining one of the top places to live in Moscow. So you have to be pretty well healed to be living in that white building behind with that rather imposing Soviet star at its crest. Now it's about time to say a farewell to Red Square as we can see it's closed its rehearsals for Victory Day but we can hardly leave without a word about the legendary concerts that have taken place in Red Square. You can't quite think of Red Square without thinking of the concerts here. Everyone has played here from Shakira. To the Scorpions. Of course, Paul McCartney in 2003. But did you know, in fact, little known, that our very own Madness did a concert of sorts here in 1992, organised, not very well organised, by Top of the Pops, but the Nutty Boys, the very same, have played right before St Basil's Cathedral here on Red Square. And on that note, time to take one step beyond. Where we've come to just now, the Vidian Hay Park, simply my favourite park in Moscow. It is just magnificent and it's actually bigger in territory than the Principality of Monaco. So, check it out. So, welcome to the Vidian Hay Park as it is now here in Moscow. This iconic park looking a little, in fact, a lot like a building site. I've been coming here for years, in fact there's still loads of people coming. I've never seen it like this, but the idea is to get it looking absolutely amazing for the time of the World Cup. So when you come and see this for yourself in June, this should all be complete and looking absolutely fantastic. As I say, the idea is to get this park, which is over 80 years old, at its best ever level. So look around though, it's really just a 
hub of activity, just a hive of building and construction as work goes on apace to get this looking at its best ever here in Moscow, the Vidin Har Park. We're going to go and check it out. Now this is one of the largest scale reconstructions to have ever taken place at this legendary park which was first established in 1935 as the All Union Agricultural Exhibition. It actually had a turbulent first few years, it wasn't completed in time before the war, it was delayed and then had to be closed during because of the war and was only then reopened in 1954. Today even when there's construction going on, the Vidian Har Park is a beloved place of Muscovites and tourists alike to come for a, as they say in Russian, pragulka, a stroll. My right is the iconic fountain, Druzhby Narod, friendly nations comprising 50 nations of the former Soviet Union. It's the centerpiece of the Vidian Ha, one of the most spectacular sites in Russia. The gold figures representing each of the former Soviet republics. By the way, in winter, the Vidian Ha turns into a winter wonderland beyond your wildest dreams. There's slides and there's fairs, and this is actually a huge skating rink. And don't take my word for that. I was here in winter with Les from our film Britain Crimea. Check it out. We are going, hopefully, to the top of this tower. We're going to slide down in the snow on a rubber ring. There we go. It's so much fun. It's hard to work climbing those stairs when you're carrying so much dense muscle. Welcome to Moscow! <laughs> <laughs> this pavilion behind me, this rather, well it's just, it's majestic isn't it, I mean it's awesome uh, building, this pavilion is actually dedicated to the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. Now there's new attractions being opened in the Vidian Ha all the time, large scale too, behind me this museum Russia, my history opened in 2016, I remember in fact it was here in 2015, it was being constructed, so just a huge scale museum eminently worth checking out but if we were to visit all of the museums in Moscow worth checking out this documentary would literally go on forever. Over there this huge scale aquarium which only opened in the past couple of years another new addition and look at this rocket Vostok a symbol of the Vidian Har Park. Now in Soviet times the pavilions would house conferences and seminars and events. There were some 300 events a year here in the Vidian Har, attracting 11 million plus visitors to the park. Since then the pavilions have become, well, their museums, their cafes, their restaurants, all sorts of interesting things. There's a cinema over there, uh, and this one here, 
cosmos, space, uh, mechanics and electrics, uh, and agriculture for the Soviet Union is uh, appealing. So let's go and see what's inside. So this turns out to be, as you can see, the Aerospace and Aviation Centre, a museum that actually only opened a few days ago. So I'm just wondering if you tell me a couple of interesting facts about the museum. Uh, well, uh, it was opened just a week ago, and uh, we have the original scent vehicle of Yuri Gagarin here. Uh, he used it on the 12th of April 1961 to return to Earth. And this here, just an amazing historical artefact, the very capsule in which Yuri Gagarin returned to Earth after the Vostok 1 space expedition of 1961, April the 12th. And this is the actual capsule in which he returned to Earth. As we can see, uh, it's charred there from the heat of re-entry and it's here in the Vidian Haar. Just amazing historical artefact, the capsule from the Vostok 1 space expedition. Underneath, just now, this recently opened Aerospace Museum in the Vidya Nahar is an exact replica of the famous Mir space station, one of the main attractions of this museum. And I think you can actually go in it. So while you can't actually go in this Mir space station itself, there's observation panels so you can look in, you can obviously get right up close to it, and there is something else here that you can go into. So cool. <laughs> that was amazing. That was amazing. Yes. Yeah? Really amazing. Did you like it? It's fantastic. Great. We're well, happy to hear it. <laughs> I was on the simulator. Yeah? It was a real adventure. Great. <laughs> So after that adventure, I came to the nearby exhibition centre because they still hold regular large-scale exhibitions in the Vidian Hall to check out uh, this exhibition dedicated to the theme of education. Now as you leave the Vidian Ha, you can't help but be struck by this silver shard soaring into the sky with a rocket on top even of what it represents, what's here, the Museum of Cosmonautics, which I've heard and I've seen is amazing. However, I do think the one space museum in a day is enough and in fact, if we look over here, we can see there's something even taller than the silver shard stretching into the sky. That is Ostankino TV Tower, the tallest freestanding structure in Europe, the 11th tallest in the whole world. She visited there in February, Valentine's Day. Have a look.
me what we're uh, looking over. What's the main features that we're uh, seeing just now when we look over? Uh, well, actually, now we are looking for a wonderful city. And over there we can see Moscow city, uh, a lot of buildings. Uh, and, uh, well, over there we, uh, we can see the center of the city and uh, actually, frankly speaking, from the tower, from Atankin TV tower, we can see the whole city because uh, the radius is approximately 60 kilometers and as the weather is fine today, you can see it, so we can see not, not only Moscow but Moscow suburbs, uh, uh, north part, north North part of Moscow region, north west part, not far away, so we can see uh, as you walk around, as you walk around. Uh, oh, what's your name? My name is Sergei. Sergei, are you from Moscow? Yes. So Sergei, if you had to describe Moscow in five words to someone who's never been to Moscow, how to describe Moscow? Well, it's the most uh, wonderful city actually. And as a Moscovite, I like it very much. I love it. I adore it. Uh, because, uh, well, it's uh, uh, this... Uh, so the city has its own history and for several centuries and uh, this history we can feel we can feel through name of streets uh, we can feel through different kind of buildings and it's amazing actually because now we have some modern ones and uh, not far away from them uh, we can see uh, a kind of ancient city uh, I mean uh, 17th century or so so what would you say Sergi is the World Cup soon there's lots of people from all over the world coming to Moscow for the first time what would you say to them uh, we are happy to see you here in Moscow and go to visit the Tower thank you very much so thank you <laughs>this rather atmospheric day in Moscow this mass statue of Peter the great legendary Russian Tsar it's 98 meters it's the eighth tallest statue in the world it is immense now the statue was put there in 1997 when I first saw it uh, my pressure was just I mean wow it's awesome it's just the uh, kind of scope of it just blows you away but it's actually been hugely divisive and controversial for many reasons. Firstly, the design. It frequently appears in lists of ugliest statues in the world. Then, there's Peter's known aversion to Moscow. In fact, he even went so far as to moving the capital to St. Petersburg. Then there's reports it was originally intended to be a statue of Italian explorer Christopher Columbus. So all of this, and then you can perhaps start to understand why reportedly Moscow authorities have been trying to offload the statue for many years, including offering it to St. Petersburg itself. They declined, and several other cities around Moscow. But it's here, it divides opinion, and it's something you definitely have to see in any case when you come to Moscow. In fact, you can hardly not see it. It's immense and it's lit up at night and I'll open a little secret to you I rather like it so it's evening time in Moscow absolutely magical the sun setting we can see the spectacular scenes all around me and Moscow by evening is quite something just to stroll around and marvel at the beauty of it all
So the weather's changed and we followed the wind of change down on this beautiful spring day to what we can see behind me, officially by order of Lenin, the Central Park of Culture and Relaxation, but of course known around the world as Gorky Park, the city's iconic, legendary Gorky Park. Now what to say about Gorky Park, founded in 1928, 300 acres, absolutely beloved by Muscovites and visitors alike. Just now, of course, it's Monday, it's a working day, so there's fewer crowds, but that means you can enjoy the promenades and the boulevards without at the weekend when this place is absolutely packed out, it's stowed, and in fact, I'm hoping to come back to Gorky Park before heading off from Moscow to show you as it is at the weekend, just a mass of activity. I was actually here in winter when the place was, as with the Vidin Ha Park, a winter wonderland. Have a look. Now Gorky Park, people absolutely love to cycle, skateboard, rollerblade, Segway, and all the rest of it. The weekend it's really quite something to see, but one of the reasons I wanted to show you Gorky Park with fewer people was we can pay more attention to the details. For example, have a look at these park benches sculpted in to the embankment, and in fact everything is clean, it's modern, it's new, and in fact that's because in 2011 the park was given a complete reboot. There were around 100 illegal objects and attractions removed. The park was given an overhaul and the aim was to make it into a global park and it is now famous all over the world. It's an epicentre of Moscow and as we can see if we look around everything is clean, in excellent condition, beautiful and it is indeed one of the most famous parks in the world, Gorky Park. So we see all around me here the maintenance team working, keeping the park clean, in order. There's new asphalt, new lawns, new flower beds, there's Wi-Fi. Everything in Gorky Park is just at the highest level. It's just one of the best parks in the world. And we are going to come back here at the weekend. Where I'm at now, Moscow City, one of the symbols of modern Moscow and Russia. It's just immense scale, scope, the power, the ambition, the glory, the beauty, the wow factor, Moscow City. Now, as you would expect, these towers host uh, top-end restaurants offering spectacular panoramic views and the likes but what I'm here to check out and actually what I've heard is a thing that's kind of on trend is to say hack I've watched travel documentaries they say for example I'm going to show you a Moscow hack and then do like letters but um, what I'm going to try and show you is a little hack uh, a tip uh, as uh, more traditional would call it is apparently one of these towers hosts not a top-end hotel or the likes but actually a hostel so you can stay in these towers in one of them in a hostel so I'm going to go and check it out this uh, hack tip from Moscow. On the 43rd floor of this skyscraper in Moscow City, there is indeed a hostel. So you can stay here for starting from just over 20 euros a night. And for that, all of this can be yours. I mean, just look at these views out of this world. I mean, just unbelievable, incredible. So that is, as they would call it, a Moscow hostel hack, all of this for a bit over 20 euros, amazing.
Moscow, of course, offers a plethora of possibilities when it comes to hotels, hostels, places to stay and all the rest of it. Where I've come now is one of perhaps the most famous hotel complexes is Mylova, actually built for the 1980 Summer Olympics and it was the biggest hotel complex in the world until overtaken by the MGM Grand in 1993. So it's a real kind of hotel city behind me here or in fact in front of me now. As we can see we're going to go and check it out. Now this complex has the capacity for over 3,500 people at any one time along with conferences and all the rest of it so it's a real epicenter of Moscow accommodation in fact when I came for the first time in 2009 to Moscow as a tourist it was this very hotel to my right that I found online and chose to stay and they're quite affordable and although the design is uh, the exterior rather is Soviet uh, which is also uh, <laughs> to my mind uh, quite fantastic the interiors are very modern and what you would expect of a modern hotel and this one here is called Alpha we've got Beta, Vega, Gamma and Delta together and these all comprise the Ismailova Hotel Complex which offers amazing views of the surrounding area which is another reason why I've come here. Now of course we've all heard of the Kremlin Red Square but here Ismailova behind me is what's called the White Kremlin. Let's go and check it out. The White Kremlin here it is mild, now unlike the Red Square Kremlin, this one has never fulfilled any authoritative or administrative functions. It was created at the start of the 19th century purely as an entertainment complex, which it remains to this day. There's museums, churches, stalls, kiosks, all for tourists. And in fact, we can see here we've got a busload of school kids coming to take in the White Kremlin. Привет! Здравствуйте! And this actually, interestingly, uh, this church was constructed in the year 2000. That is a pink Lenin. So this is a pink Lenin and the writer Maxim Gorky. I didn't expect to see a pink Lenin here. Let alone a blue Maxim Gorky. But the headline is the pink Lenin. <laughs> very nice, very nice, wonderful. Wonderful. Where do you come from? Thailand. From Thailand. Pleased to meet you ladies. Yeah. Lovely selfie there. There we go. Cheese. Cheese. This behind me, the uh, Agency Ministry of Joy, which is responsible for all of the weddings and events which take place on the territory of Ismailova. <laughs> Ministry of Joy. Now I've been coming to Moscow for years and this is just one of the many places that in fact it's my first time here had never been before and that's Moscow it just offers you so many unexpected I mean Pink Lenin who would have thought uh, things to see even for those that have been coming for years there's always something new and unexpected. Привет. Привет. Познакомиться? Очень приятно. Михаил. Очень приятно, Миша. Репортажи ваши смотрю всегда. Спасибо Из большое. Донбасса. Where I'm at just now, the Arbat 
in central Moscow, one of the most famous streets in the city, and in fact it's the real tourist mecca, the real just draw tourists and people from all over the world. We can see just crowds surging, it's absolutely buzzing here, uh, and it is actually a historical street as well. It's one of the oldest streets in Moscow, dating from the 15th century, and for centuries it's had a reputation as the bohemian, kind of artsy centre of Moscow, the kind of alternative. In fact, we can see to this day there's all sorts of different concessions. We've got up there the Museum of Records and Facts. We've got here a restaurant. We've got here souvenir shops offering Russian fur hats, Russian baseball caps, and all the rest of it, all sorts of Russia-related paraphernalia. But of course, the Arbat hasn't been exempt from globalization. We've got KFC there. And rather interestingly here, we have a Ukrainian flag because this is the Ukrainian cultural centre. So interestingly, despite all of the dreadful things that Ukraine and the Ukrainian government tells us about Russia and Russian aggression and all the rest of it, here in the centre of Moscow we have a Ukrainian cultural centre peacefully existing. This, in any case, is just the street with just a million things going on. There's just absolutely masses of people and all sorts of activity and hustle and it is the place to come in Moscow if you want to do what people call people watching. So let's have a look at the Arbat. Here's the place. Sasha. But in any case, Russian dolls here, here, here. So as any tourist in Russia, of course, you'll be wanting your Russian dolls. And the Arbat is the place. Uh, and I'll give you another hack, uh, as they call it. You can negotiate in price a bit here. And by the way, let me tell you an interesting fact about the Arbat. This was the first street in the Soviet Union to be pedestrianized. The first pedestrianized zone in the whole Soviet Union. This is it. So that was the old Arbat. This is the new Arbat. We can see not pedestrianized, the hub of traffic and foot fair, people passing. We've got to my right a Putin uh, gastrobar. And these buildings are light, light up. It looks spectacular. They kind of dance in different colours. It's quite a sight to behold this, the new Arbat. station was constructed around 1975 originally planned but then they didn't finish it for almost 40 years and it was only with the completion of the Adkriti Arena in 2014 that's where Spartak Moscow played but this metro was completed and we can see it's all football themes A football themed metro station must must visit. Well, the Kriti Arena translates as open arena. Although during the World Cup 2018, in which it's going to host five matches, it will also be known as the Spartak Arena.
So I've got my Russia top on to show solidarity because this stadium plays host to the Russia national team as well as Spartak Moscow, the most successful team in the history of Russian football named after this, the gladiator Spartacus behind me, this rather impressive figure and this just hugely impressive stadium here, the Spartak Arena at Krytny Arena. Now this stadium uh, began construction, the original design, in 2007 but was then stopped in 2010 because the original design was deemed too ordinary. So they went back to the drawing board and came up with this about which you can say many things but you certainly cannot say it's ordinary. This is true state-of-the-art stadium design. Just fantastic stuff. Modernistic, futuristic and it holds over 45,000 spectators. We can see behind me the Luzhniki Stadium. I've got my three lines on, I'm here, I'm in the mood, and this, the largest football stadium in Russia. The name Luzhniki translates roughly as meadows, and we can see all around this beautiful panoramic scene. But more importantly, this is the main stadium of the World Cup 2018. There's gonna be seven matches here, including the World Cup final. And we see this panoramic point here overlooking the Luzhniki. People love coming here, taking photos, looking at the views. And who can blame? I'm sure you'll come here yourself when you're in Moscow just to take it in. It's amazing, so beautiful. Hello. Hello. <laughs> see here we've got uh, another mass photo taking place with a backdrop of this stadium and just an amazing stadium, an amazing story constructed between 1955 and 1956 in 450 days, such a short space of time, bringing materials from all over the Soviet Union, from Armenia, from Ukraine, from Belarus, to construct what was at the time a world leading stadium and what is after recent renovation in 2013 again a world leading stadium and more just a work of art, a work of architecture that just to look at is just fills you full of the mood of sporting magnitude of great sporting moments. The capacity in times of the Soviet Union was over 100,000, 103,000. The capacity to this day, in fact nowadays rather, is 81,000. It's still one of the biggest stadiums in Europe. And just to look at, I mean, you just feel just the sense of sporting magic here in Moscow. And when we're speaking about memorable sporting moments, the Summer Olympics 1980 opening and closing ceremonies held at this stadium. But we England fans would most likely know it for the 2008 Champions League final, Man United versus Chelsea. Penalties, Ronaldo steps, check saves. Terry steps up, slips, hits the post. The heartbreak, the drama, then Giggs calmly slots and decides in United's favour. Just the epic sporting moments and surely more to come in the World Cup 2018. More drama, more emotion, more heartbreak, but let's hope above all that we England fans see each other here on July the 15th, 2018 for the World Cup final. Let's hope that those years of hurt finally come to an end. The dream lives on. A little message to uh, people from all over the world, from Russia, uh, before the World Cup. Maybe, maybe... <laughs> Welcome to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> Russia is the greatest 
country in the world. <laughs> yes. Welcome to Russia! <laughs> So here we are, Manezhnaya, this square here, just down from Red Square we can see up to my left. This building here of course we saw from the other side the Museum of History, this iconic Four Seasons Hotel behind me and in fact the centrepiece of this square, this statue to Marshal Zhukov. Now Marshal Zhukov, Georgie Zhukov rose to the highest rank in the Soviet Red Army, notable in particular for his heroism in the Battle of Berlin in which his heroic deeds were instrumental in defeating the Nazis. So that statue there, the center point, the center piece, and all around we can see there's tourists, there's just all sorts of street theaters. I say there's Lenin strolling around, there's Stalin posing for a photo. There we go. We can see all around there's groups, there's there we go, mentioning Zhukov right there, Office of Excursions, and in fact Moscow is an absolute beloved city of tourists. Record numbers, in fact in 2014, 16.5 million tourists visited Moscow, and we can see all around me, this is a city beloved of tourists from all around the world, we can see this square here. This Four Seasons Hotel, the legend is that Stalin himself personally oversaw this project. That's the legend. This, the World Cup countdown clock, I remember it when the number was much higher. We're entering now, just next to Red Square, and uh, people absolutely, just a wave of people coming through from one of the most beloved sites of Moscow, is Alexander Garden, constructed in 1821 to mark victory over Napoleon in 1812. So this here, very much the centerpiece of Alexander Garden. The Eternal Flame, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, representing all of those killed in conflict in World War II, the Great Patriotic War, all of those unknown soldiers killed in conflict, this, the Eternal Flame. Leningrad, Kiev, Minsk, Stalingrad, Sevastopol. These monuments representing the 13 hero cities of the Soviet Union which resisted, which survived Nazi occupation, which fought against the Nazis, were liberated and gave hope to the rest of the nation. We can see here Odessa, Kerch, Novorossiysk, Breskaya Krepost, Tula, Murmansk, Smolensk, Where we're going now is the queue for the place that we're outside the ramparts of and the place that if you say Russia to people most all over the world, the first association will be Kremlin and that is where we're going just now to the Kremlin. My first ever time uh, going inside the Kremlin. So it turns out to purchase tickets for the Kremlin there is almost no queue. 
So we're here, there's all the different parts you can go, all the different, the armory chamber, the architectural complex, the New Kremlin Square, all the different uh, parts you can check out. From prices starting from 250 rubles, so three pounds, uh, 700 there. So it's obviously uh, it's about eight pounds, eight pounds fifty. So all these different parts of the Kremlin that you can uh, check out. So we're going to go for the architectural complex. So where we are just now, we've got in with almost no queue, just breeze through, is the approach to one of the most famous buildings, structures, fortifications in the whole world. It's also been inhabited, this site, since the second century BC. Then it was Finno-Ugric, you'll have to Google that. The Slavs came in the 11th century and then in 1331, the first recorded use of the word Kremlin entered the history books. And we're about now to enter the Kremlin. In case you wonder, by the way, the territory of the Kremlin is 27 and a half hectares. Uh, so we're going to see of it what we can today. Wow, we can look down uh, Alexander Garden. Now the original Kremlin was constructed between 1482 to 1495 and since then it's been synonymous with power. This is the heart of Moscow, the heart of Russia, the seat of power, but of course it's also beloved by tourists. We can see just phalanxes of tourists from all over the world, uh, Asian here by the looks and sounds, and we can see over here again tourists everywhere all over this territory, the Kremlin. And we've got these uh, two different phalanxes here looking like uh, politicians or people uh, looking like a delegation perhaps and then over here of course tourists so the Kremlin fulfills these two purposes I mean, it is a tourist uh, just absolute the, mo the most the number one spot in Moscow but it is also a working functioning seat of power here and these here Russian fuel cannon 17th 18th centuries as it says here, preserved in the Kremlin since the first half of the 19th century, is monuments of military glory moved from the arsenal in 2012. Now the Kremlin is of course the largest military fortress, the largest fortress in Russia, and it's evolved over the centuries. If we look over here, we can see of course some basils and red square and this Spaskaya tower, the star on top. Now they weigh around a ton each, those stars weigh around a ton and they actually rotate with the wind. And it was actually designed by an Italian architect, so the Kremlin has evolved from wood to stone to brick and it's done so with international participation over the centuries. So here it is, as I mentioned earlier, the largest cannon in the world in all its glory and it really is glory. I mean look at it, it's just uh, something to behold. We can see here the Tsar's cannon made from bronze in 1586 and uh, the Moscow Cannon factory, the master was uh, designer was Andrei Chekhov, and then this uh, encasing, the wheels, uh, and all of the etching is from 1835 from St. Petersburg, is 890 millimeter caliber, 40 tons. Goodness me, that is a cannon. As I understand, it only fired once for ceremonial purposes. But there it is, the world's heaviest cannon. Now we can see behind me a stage being erected over here, there's work going on and if we look all around of course we can see tourists being uh, led in processions, in groups, selfies, it is all going on in the Kremlin. This is very much the place in Russia, the epicentre, the centrepiece where if there's an event is upcoming Victory Day, it will be here in the Kremlin that it's marked in spectacular and ceremonial style. There are five palaces here, there are four cathedrals, that's to put it into numbers, there are 20 towers, all of, uh, all of the towers have names, but two, they're called unnamed one and two. 
To put it into politics, the President of Russia, President Putin, still has his office here in the Kremlin, still comes to work in the Kremlin often by helicopter, but very much comes here to make decisions for Russia from the Kremlin. Let's have a look. here the largest bell in the world although as I read it was never chimed because as we can see there's a bit missing but here it is again the, the scale the the magnitude of it and if we look over there we see again Spasskaya Tower now in 1706 Peter the Great brought a new clock here all the way from Amsterdam uh, it was transported in 30 wagons and every time now the bells are chiming, every British person can feel a sense of, we did that because the chimes were designed by a British engineer, Christopher Halloway in 1625. So what you're hearing is a little bit of Britain in the Kremlin in the heart of Russia, because those chimes were designed by a British engineer. <laughs> So it's closing time now, the chimes have struck, it's after five, the Kremlin is closing. Now we obviously got here later in the day, had we got here earlier we could have taken in the gardens over there, we could have walked along the original city ramparts, the original walls of the Kremlin and looked over the Moskva and that is all for you to do in your Kremlin visit. We had a packed day and we got here later in the day so couldn't do it all, you can easily spend an entire day in the Kremlin. And here it is now as the crowds make their way for the exit. Closing time at the Kremlin. Well, that's not quite everything. There's so much in Moscow to show that we just couldn't fit it all into the film. Here's a bit of what we just couldn't quite find space in the film for. And that really is everything. So if you liked it, put a like, put a comment, and make sure you stay subscribed to this channel for much more to come from Russia with love. For now, thanks very much for watching, and bye for now from Russia, from Moscow.